We'll see from those verses. Uh, Luke 18, 1 says, Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Right. And then we found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, we find the thought, pray without ceasing. These are the command from God, pray without ceasing. And the challenge from God, for that men ought always to pray and not faint. Our Father, again, we thank you for the Word of God. It is quick, it is powerful, it is sharpening, two-edged sword, and it does pierce even the divine asunder of soul and spirit. Now, Father, we ask of you that you might manifest yourself and help us this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so we look at this, uh, this idea that we find that it was a charge, it's a challenge, it's a command that we pray. We, we saw this morning uh, that it is an essential for the Christian to be a man of prayer or be a person of prayer. It is essential. There is no salvation outside of prayer. And we saw that uh, God has placed into us the spirit of the God crying out, Abba, Father, something inside of us. It started out by prayer. We called upon the Lord to be saved. From somewhere down inside, our soul called out to God. It was not our spirit that called out to God because our spirit was dead in trespasses and sins. Right. It was not alive. It certainly was not our flesh that called out to God for our flesh liked sin. But the soul, that inner being, that knows that the soul that sinneth it shall die, knows that the wages of sin is death, and does not want to die. He cries out. Now, I believe in the trichotomy of man. You say, why do you believe in the trichotomy of man? Because God said your whole spirit, soul, and body makes three different parts. It is hard to tell the difference between the soul and the spirit, but they're two different parts. And God's word discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart, but it divides even, so cuts asunder even soul and spirit. It shows you there's a division of those two. And so we find that the soul cries out because it's not dead. Right. <clears throat> but it will die. You say, how do you know? Because you can't kill something that's already dead. And the soul that sent it, it shall die. There is a future judgment of the soul. This is, this is why the, I believe the Bible, because it, it defines itself. The spirit is dead in trespasses and sins. It died. We, don't, we didn't have a living spirit, but God regenerates, gives a life to the spirit. Now God, so it's necessary as the soul cries out, then God regenerates the spirit, gives us a life, and that more abundantly. And when that life of the spirit of God the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit moves in and gives our spirit life. And these spirits commune together. Guess what happens? All of a sudden, something inside of us wants to pray. Because we desire to pray. And so we find it is essential in the Christian life. It is the evidence of the Christian life. We notice that as those that we saw that the contrast of the saints in 1 Corinthians, he said, uh, that with all and in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. But in a, the, that's the saints, but the ants, it says about the ants, it says, have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and call not upon the Lord. That is, it is an essential, it's an evidence. Paul prayed. It told us that. We read that earlier today. Uh, uh, he says, uh, And the Lord said unto him, and he talked about Ananias, Arise and go to the street which is called Straight, 
and inquired in the house of Judas for one called Paul, Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. It is the evidence of the Christian life. And if there is no evidence, why would you believe something to be true? If you went to court, they bring up evidence. If somebody was asked you to give evidence of your salvation, could you say, I pray? Could you say, I really pray? I pray in my prayer. I really get through to God. I really talk to God. I have fellowship with Him. I know Him and He knows me. It is essential for the Christian life. It is the evidence of the Christian life. And I would like to tell you it is the encouragement in the Christian life. Prayer. The encouragement in the Christian life. In Luke 14 and verse 17, and I'm going to use this as a springboard, he says, and he sent his servant at a supper time and say unto them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. God has made us to where we can pray. He's made all things ready so you and I can pray. And that's something that you and I need to realize. God has done everything for us to make us be able to pray. There's nothing that needs to be done except for us to yield ourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead and our members as instruments of righteousness unto God. If we yield to God, God made everything ready so that we can pray. Can I tell you this, that the way of access is ready so that we can pray? Do we not know in Matthew 27, verse number 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. We remember now the, the altar of incense was outside the veil. But now that the veil is rent, now that golden censer, that altar of incense, is inside the veil, and it has the that the saints, the, the prayers of the saints is what is uh, coming up from that altar of incense. He tells us in Hebrews that we're, the, the way, the access is made ready. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say his flesh. He has made the way for us to have access. We are accepted in the beloved. But not only are we accepted in the beloved, but we have access by the beloved. Romans chapter 5 in verse number 2. He makes the statement in Romans 5 and verse number 2. By whom we have access by faith. Into this grace where we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Our standing is in this accessibility that we have. And in Ephesians, he deals with this even more so on this idea of the uh, access that we have to God. We have access. And you and I need to uh, enjoy the fact that we have access to the throne of grace where we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What is our access? Well, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 18, he makes the statement. Uh, he says, For through him we both have access by one spirit under the Father. You want to, you want to go to the throne of grace? That's where, that's, that is Christ. He is the throne of grace. We come through his, we come through the the, the, the veil is rent, which is his flesh according to Hebrews 10. And so we can come boldly to the Father by Jesus Christ. There none of them have said, there, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes under the Father but by me. We pray to the Father. We say, our Father, how do we get there? We have access by Jesus Christ. Our access. The access 
is bad. Chapter 3 of the book of uh, uh, Ephesians, verse number 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So you and I, huh? He says, he said, we got we can come boldly to the throne of grace. We can come confidently. I said it earlier. We do not come arrogantly, but we can come confidently. And we can ask anything according to his will. That's the confidence we have in him that we ask anything according to his will. That he heareth us. And, and if we know that he hears what's where we ask, we know that we have a petition that we desire of him. It is ready. Already made. We have access. The access is ready because our advocate is ready. There is one in heaven, even right now. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is interceding for us even right now. We pray. But as we pray, He prays. And he is praying even when we're not praying. I might say, would you pray for me? And you might say, yes, I will. And you may forget, but he will not forget you. He's graving you on the palm of his hand. Uh, can a woman forget her sucking child if she not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yes, she may forget. Oh, but I'll not forget thee. I've graved thee on the palm. He, every time he looks at his hands, he, he prays for me. He, he remembers me. He prays for me. We have an advocate with the Father. Oh, he, he continueth ever. Uh, that, and he had an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost to come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. He's our high priest. He's harmless. He's high. He, he, the Bible tells us uh, he's holy, he's harmless, he's undefiled, he's separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. He needed not daily as those high priests uh, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself. He made himself the sacrifice and now he's our intercessor who ever liveth to make intercession for us. We have access <clears throat> and we have an advocate. We have somebody praying for us, praying with us. We can enter into prayer with the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you not watch with me one hour? He brought his disciples to his prayer closet so they could see him pray. Now, they did not always hear him pray. You say, how do you know? Because he'd go a little farther down the road from them. But they could see him pray. They knew where he was praying. And they knew he was praying for them. But not for them only, but for all them that believe on him through the word of God. Is what he tells us in the book of John. He is praying for us. He is praying with us. We have access in prayer by Jesus Christ. We have an advocate in prayer who is Jesus Christ. And we have the ability in prayer by Jesus Christ. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And that spirit is being mentioned in Romans chapter uh, 8. In verse number 9, spirit, that, that Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ. And then he tells us in verse 26, he tells us in verse 26 of Romans 8, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh it groaning or maketh intercession for us. Remember I told you supplications is us praying for ourselves. Intercession is somebody else praying for you, us praying for somebody else. The Spirit of God living inside of us intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He, that's, that's what he does. Our advocate ever lived to make intercession for us and then the Spirit of God living inside of us 
makes us feel us the ability to pray. Even when we don't know how to pray. Even when we don't know what to pray. He's not just praying for us, but He's praying in us. He's ready. He made access for us. The access for prayer is ready. Our advocate in prayer is ready. Our, our ability to pray, the, the ability to pray is ready. And let me say this. The answers to prayer are ready. The answers are ready. 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 13, we know these things that are written unto you to believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Now He says what He tells us. And if we know that He hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have petitions that we desire of Him. Whatsoever we have. If it's according to the will, if it's in Jesus' name, not our will, not my will be done, but thine be done. Not my desires that I can heap it upon my own lust. Not my presumptuousness thinking that God's out there to do good for me. He is going to do good for you, but He's going to glorify Himself. He'll do good unto you before He does good for you. He'll work in you before He works for you. He's done it all for us already. But God wants to do more in us than He wants to do for us. You wonder why you're not getting the answers that you want for your prayer requests. Did not Paul wonder why? Did he not stay praying even three times until God finally said, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. What was God trying to tell him? He said, I'm doing something in you. Because that's what I'm doing for you. I'm giving you the answer. You say, well, God does not speak to me in an audible voice. Why not? If he spoke to Paul in an audible voice, why does he not speak to us in an audible voice? If he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You say it's a different dispensation. The only way God speaks is through his word. Tell me when God said Sunday morning at 10 o'clock mm -hmm. is when you're supposed to get to church. Or 9.30, 9.45, depending on where you work for church. Why God? He said not to forsake the assembling ourselves together as manner of some is. He said that we bring our tithes and offerings the first day of the week in the storehouse. We can find all kinds of principles, but you will not find some specifics of certain things. But God does speak. And you say, well, He never speaks to me. My sheep hear my voice. There's only two reasons a person does not hear the voice of God. Number one is they're not His sheep. The other is there's too many other sounds. Young Brother Richard was listening to Miss Pat earlier speak. I was trying to speak to Miss Victoria. Young Brother Richard didn't say something to Miss Victoria and, uh, or something up here. And uh, Young Brother Richard and I was saying something out loud. And uh, he thought I was trying to get, and I'm just trying to get, these, get the service started. And uh, Brother Garrett and Miss Victoria were up here getting, and, uh, there's, and I'm just trying to get a hold of them. Just trying to talk a little bit. You know what? He turned around and said, I'm listening to Miss Pat. Now, he wasn't being mean. He was just telling me. He, wasn't, he, he was just telling me that he was listening to Miss Pat, what she was talking, trying to hear what she was saying. Too many sounds. 
If you're trying to listen to two conversations at the same time, you ever done that? Yeah. <laughs> you're not, not hearing either one of them. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Not if they're hearing another voice at the same time, they're listening to too many sounds. You're either not a sheep or there's too many sounds. Shut the sounds off and you can hear what he has to say. That's why you go in your closet. Shut the door and pray. And when you shut the door, make sure you've invited him in so he's not standing out there. Hey, I want to come sup with you and you with me. I mean, he brings the meal with him. I, I preached that a few weeks ago. But here's what I'm saying is you need to understand that we need to come to this place where we say, I want to hear Jesus so that I can ask things according to His will. I want to hear Jesus so when I do ask things that I think are according to His will, that He'll speak to me. Because not every detail is written in the Word of God. And I have said it, and I'll say it again, you'll never speak contrary to the Word of God. But not every word he says to his child is in the Word of God. Every word he says to his child is the Word of God, because God speaks. But if all you've got is your King James Bible, tell me what you're doing with the rest of the getting the job you got. I have never seen, never seen, become an electrician. Maybe I've never seen it because I'm not an electrician, I'm not going to become an electrician. I've never seen become go into uh, sell your business and move. I didn't see that. Speaking to any of us. And if you can find it, I can show you verses that have confirmed everything I've done. When I say that, that I've done in, in the will of God. I can show you verses to confirm it, but I cannot show you verses that called me to do some of these things. But can I say the answers to our prayer are ready? Let me just give you two that I know of that are ready. In the book of Matthew, we'll find our prayer for rest. God says, you say, I, I'm, I'm laboring, I'm heavy laden. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, I'm burdened, God. I'm having a hard time. He said, just come unto me. Just get close to me. He's ready to answer. All we got to do is come. All we got to do is run to Him. All we got to do is spend our time with Him. You don't think He gave Paul some rest when He said, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Do you not think He gave Paul the rest, Paul the rest of that fact? He said, Hey, listen, I don't like it, but I like it. You say, Why do I like it? Because I'm right smack down in the will of God. Right in the center of His will. Yeah. I don't like it, but I like it. Why? Because God spoke. And he's the one who said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I'll give you rest for your soul. Take my yoke upon you. Learn to me. For I have meek and lowly. You shall find rest unto your soul. Matthew teaches us this reality. If we're praying for rest from our situations or in our situation, God says, I'm ready to answer. Just come to me. Those, uh, those young Hebrew men that were cast in the fiery furnace, they said, we're not, we're not, uh, I, I don't remember the exact word, but he, they said, we're not, we're not being rude or anything, King. And our answer, but our God 
will deliver us. And even if he doesn't, we're not going to buy. Mm -hmm. Say what? I mean, we're not speaking arrogantly. We're not speaking just sharply. We're not speaking in an irreverent or a irrespectful, disrespectful way. But then we can't do this. And you know what? Why? Because God had spoke to them. Just rest in the Word of God. Just rest in the God of the Word. And they got in that fiery furnace. They had to go through it. They had to go through it. But God was with them. And they looked in. The king said, Whoa, dudes. He said, He didn't say dudes. I, I probably didn't. He was a king. He probably had his robe on and everything. He said, Oh, gentlemen. But if it would have been me, it said, Dudes. Look at this. We threw them in y'all for a throw and throw them four up in. Man, y'all got to see this. There's four of them down there. And they're dancing around having a good time. I mean, they're not even singed their hair or nothing like that. Man, oh man, oh man. There's four of them down there. And one of them looks like the Son of God. They learned to rest because he spoke. He speak a word in season to them that are weary. Can I say our prayers for rest? God said, I will answer your prayers for rest. God said he'd answer our prayer for souls. Our prayers for souls. Now it is up to the soul. It's up to the sinner to come. But God says, in verse nine, or chapter 9 and verse number 17 of the book of Nehemiah, he says, But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great kindness, and forsookest them not. We start praying. God, will you do a work in the souls of men? As we pray for Shelbyville, as we pray for sinners, as we pray for strange saints. And he says, God is merciful, gracious, and he's not forsaken. For the system is the word there. He's not forsaken. He has not given up on them. He is not one of the men should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now the Calvinists will say it's just all of the elect. No, all of the elect are the ones who have come to repentance. But all. He's not forsaking the world. He loved the world. Yes. He loved all. He would have all men. And that word there is a generic word meaning all mankind to be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus. All. not because he's forsaken them. The only way that they can end up in hell is because they forsake him. As he draws. And he draws. And he draws. The only other thing that the other, so we need to pray the Lord of hearts and sit with neighbors in his hearts and then we need to go to the hearts. Because what if God said, I want to save that one. I want to save Shelby people. And we say, okay, God, do it. He says, go to you. And we say, well, I'm too busy, God. And then we want to say, well, God didn't answer the prayers for Shelby people. Maybe he didn't need to call for Shelby people. Maybe he didn't need to call for Burkina Faso. Maybe he didn't to call, he to call for the pain. Maybe he didn't need to call for um, Jerusalem. Maybe he didn't need to call. He just sat there and he said, well, I'm afraid. Let me say this. I've been preaching on prayer, but I am not going to make this whole thing saying 